While many films from the 90s hold up to this day, others are, sadly, so of their time that there's little reason to revisit them, save for a quick dose of nostalgia. From sci-fi to prestige dramas, here are some 90s films that haven't aged well. Released at the very onset of early internet culture, Ian Softley's Hackers isn't just an ode to the Oregon Trail generation. It's a bright, shiny encapsulation of mid-90s computer technology in all its rollerblading glory. Hike the planet! Hike the planet! Shut up and get in the car! Hike the planet! Hike the planet! The film centers on a group of teen hackers in New York. Led by Dade, Zero Cool, Slash Crash Override Murphy, and Kate Acidburn Libby, along with their friends a serial killer, Lord Nikon, and the Phantom Freak, Dade and Kate unite a worldwide network of hackers to take down Ellingson Mineral Company. Computer security officer Eugene the Plague Belford and Secret Service agent Richard Gill. Hackers worked in 1995 if for no other reason than the fact that the internet was still such a new commodity. Many households had little to no interaction with the World Wide Web outside of a few AOL emails. And the idea that the internet actually looked like something, in this case a mix of virtual cityscape and those old magic eye posters, was totally believable because people had no idea that it didn't actually look like anything. Add to that a group of high schoolers who exemplify the very height of 90s rave fashion, and you've got a film that's pretty impossible to watch outside of nostalgia's sake. Like Hackers, 1995's The Net was a reflection of a time when it was clear that Hollywood had no idea what the internet was actually like. Unlike Hackers, however, The Net took a far less optimistic approach to computers. In this film, systems analyst Angela Burnett stumbles upon a cyber conspiracy that revolves around the use of a computer security system called Gatekeeper. Once involved, Angela becomes a target of Greg Microsystems, the software company that owns and operates Gatekeeper. Her identity is erased, replaced with that of a woman wanted by the FBI for, among other things, prostitution. It's a movie that spends two hours trying to make a piece of malware look like it can take down the entire US government. The net also buys into the idea that people who work with computers are unable to also have social lives. The biggest problem for Angela once she loses her identity is that she can't convince anyone of who she is because she she doesn't actually talk to anyone in the real world. Her entire life exists online, from any sort of meaningful social interaction to ordering pizza. In 1995, that was a potential death sentence. Today, it's Twitter and Grubhub. The early 90s wasn't kind to video game adaptations. Super Mario Bros. failed to impress, and star Bob Hoskins famously called the film, quote, the worst thing I ever did. The following year, both Double Dragon and Street Fighter fared even worse, with one critic calling the former a, quote, low IQ futuristic slugfest, while the latter was marked by its inability to live up to its source material. As for Mortal Kombat, which hit theaters in August 1995, it stuck pretty close to the original game's narrative. Three Earthrealm fighters, Liu Kang, Johnny Cage, and Sonya Blade, are recruited by God of Thunder, Raiden, to fight against Shang Tsung and the invading forces of Outworld in an interdimensional tournament. It's a simple plot, but it was a simple game. And at the time of its release, it all sort of worked. Looking at it now, though, through the lens of over 25 years of technological advancements and arguably improvements in scripting, Mortal Kombat is a complete cheese fest that's difficult to sit through without laughing. The dialogue comes across like parody, with Shang Tsung's over-the-top villainous one-liners of particular note. Your brother's soul is mine. <laughs> you will be next. But the worst offense here is the effects, which were, by 1995 standards, passable. Today, though, let's just forget about Scorpion's palm spear. The 1997 rom-com Chasing Amy tells the story of Holden McNeil, a comic book artist who falls in love with fellow artist Alyssa Jones. There is, however, one difficult obstacle in the way of Holden's pursuit of her. Alyssa is a lesbian. Ultimately, the pair do embark on a romantic relationship, but it's played with issues. Specifically, Holden's insecurity to finding out he isn't the first man Alyssa has been with. Upon its release, the film was lauded for its progressive approach to sexuality and relationships, and it earned Kevin Smith an Independent Spirit Award for its screenplay. But Chasing Amy isn't without its flaws. The film has come under fire for perpetuating an idea that a woman who identifies as a lesbian just needs to find the right man in order to go straight, and that if a guy tries hard enough, he can convince any woman to fall in love with him regardless of her sexual preference. In an interview with BuzzFeed News, Guinevere Turner, the real-life inspiration for Alyssa's character, noted that she understands the aversion newer audiences might have toward the film. However, she defends it for being one of the first to portray a lesbian character with a, quote, complicated sexuality. 
For anyone entering into adulthood in the mid-90s, Reality Bites was pretty much considered required viewing. Centering on the post-college lives of four friends, Lelena, Troy, Vicky, and Sammy, who lived together in Houston, the film was a perfect encapsulation of the era and the disenfranchised youth that made up Generation X. In 1994, having no direction in life and a competitive type attitude towards your friends was kind of attractive, so long as you could write terrible coffeehouse poetry and talk for hours about important social and moral issues or chain-smoking a pack of Marlboro Reds. Today, you'd probably get dropped from your friend group. We're specifically talking about Troy here, because looking at reality bites through a modern lens makes one thing perfectly, painfully clear. Troy was the absolute worst. The 90s were shockingly forgiving of some pretty unforgiving behaviors, especially when it came from a guy in a loose button-down with unkempt hair and a crooked smile. Troy was narcissistic, emotionally manipulative, and just kind of mean. I am really in love with you. <laughs> Is that what you want to hear? Is it? While guys like Troy continue to exist in cinema today, they genuinely don't get the girl in the end because the girl has had enough of Troy's garbage. Four years before Keanu Reeves took on the role of Neo in the Matrix trilogy, he played Johnny, the mnemonic courier turned internet hero in Robert Longo's cyberpunk sci-fi thriller Johnny Mnemonic. In Longo's film, information is currency. People like Johnny have data storage devices implanted into their brains for the express purpose of transferring sensitive information across the net for various corporations and organized crime circuits. When Johnny's latest package happens to contain the cure for a neurological disease caused by using the internet, He's forced into a fight not only with the head of a pharmacological company that wants it for himself, but also with the Yakuza. As entertaining as Johnny Mnemonic is, and watching Reeves' Johnny team up with Ice-T and a cybernetic dolphin is endlessly entertaining, it's hard to ignore just how bad the film's depiction of future tech is. In order to access his brain's hard drive, Johnny enters into a VR world through the use of a giant visor, a pair of gloves that look like high-tech protective padding, and a fax machine. Because in 2021, the best and fastest way to transmit information still involves dial-up. Longo probably meant for Johnny Mnemonic to be some kind of statement on society's inevitable enslavement to technology. But it's hard to buy into that when VCRs play a huge role in that vision. American Beauty is something of an anomaly here in that it took home five Academy Awards, sweeping most of the major categories. At the heart of the film is Lester Burnham, a middle-aged magazine exec whose life is anything but fulfilling. When it all starts to unravel, Lester embarks on a path of self-discovery and improvement, one that also happens to include actively pursuing his teenage daughter's best friend, Angela. As cringeworthy as that particular storyline may be on its own, what makes this one especially awful to watch is the shadow of Spacey's personal life that looms so heavily over it, and subsequently over every other role he's had on screen. Following a series of sexual assault allegations from over 30 victims, Spacey's career has been tainted, and trying to sit through an on-screen flirtation between him and a young woman is anything but entertaining. Nestled into the summer of 1999 was a film that would go on to define an entire generation and one that would have a slew of sequels and spin-offs, American Pie. The raunchy teen comedy made waves with its graphic depiction of coming-of-age hilarity, and it also launched the careers of a number of actors. Some went on to have continued success, while others, not so much. American Pie has no shortage of vulgar jokes and tasteless scenes, but there's one in particular that makes it completely unwatchable today. When Jim's friends convince him to set up a webcam in his room so they can watch foreign exchange student Nadia undress, the act is treated like any other joke in the film. God bless the internet. It's one that supposedly gets funnier once Jim decides to join in. Nowadays, the same sort of joke would be punishable by a hefty fine and jail time. Filming someone without their consent isn't funny. The fact that Nadia winds up losing her sponsorship over it, thereby being the one punished, is even worse. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.